Okay, welcome everybody. Um, <clears throat> for this morning's uh, session, we, we've got um, making our classrooms and institutions more open and equitable. Um, I think there's still some more people entering. Uh, is that correct, Jocelyn? Okay, I'll wait. I can go now? Okay, where do you think I should wait? Okay. <laughs> um, and we have three speakers today. Um, just a, a, a bit of housekeeping. Uh, you can click on the closed captioning button uh, to have closed captions. Um, and I need to also remind everybody we'll be distributing a, um, <clears throat> a survey after the conference and we encourage you to uh, complete those and, and return them to us. Um, so today's session or this morning session, making our classrooms and institutions more open and equitable. We've got three speakers. Uh, we'll have a, a breakout room or three breakout rooms after a 20 minute uh, talk to start with. Um, but the first speaker will be Una Daly. Uh, Una is the director of the Community College Consortium for Open Educational Resources at Open Ed Global. Um, and she is joined by Tanja Connerly. Dr. Conner Connerly is a full-time sociology professor uh, local here to Houston at San Jacinto College. Um, and she is a sociologist. And we also have Ursula Pike. Uh, she is the associate director of Digital Higher Education Consortium of Texas, otherwise known as uh, Digitex. Um, so I want to uh, welcome you all. And I want to, uh, I don't want to take too much time from the speakers because I know um, uh, the time is short. So um, let, let's turn it over to you, Una. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, David. Um, yeah, I'm very excited to be here today with my colleagues to share with you um, about how we can make um, higher education more equitable, starting with our own classrooms and institutions. So thank you for joining us. Um, I want to give uh, my uh, colleagues a moment just to say hello and uh, if they want to say anything uh, about uh, their work. Uh, Ursula, shall we start with you? Sure. Hi, my name is Ursula Pike and I'm the Associate Director of the Digital Higher Ed Consortium of Texas. Um, I'm also a SPARC uh, OER fellow this, this year. And the three of us are on the CCC OER Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Committee. Yes, thank, thank you, Ursula. Yeah, and, and Ursula also sits on my executive council for CCC OER, so thrilled to have her with me. And Tanja. Hello and good morning. My name is Tanja Connerly, and I am a full-time professor here in Houston, Texas at San Jacinto College. And I have been on this equity path for a very long time. Uh, I utilize OpenStax Intro to Sociology. Uh, I've been utilizing it for nine years in my intro class. And uh, I'm also helping contribute to the third edition, um, trying to most definitely uh, increase the diversity and equity within um, the sociology textbook as well. Wonderful. And Tanja and I have been working together for, I'm going to say about four years now. Um, I had the pleasure of meeting her during Achieving the Dream when she was leading the, um, the, the work at San Jacinto College. Um, so just thrilled to be uh, working with her again. And um, as David mentioned, I'm Una Daly, the director of CCCOER. Um, and I just wanted to tell you just really quickly a little bit about CCCOER. So we were founded in 2007. We're a national organization with, with uh, member colleges around the country. And in fact, we just got a new member college from Alberta, Canada. So, um, but we're part of a larger organization that um, has uh, members in 40 countries around the world. So it's really about open education writ large. Um, and I'm so thrilled to have nine members, uh, nine colleges who are members of CCCOER right here in Texas. So you are the second largest state in terms of um, OER. And you've been leading this area for a long time. Um, and I'm just really briefly going to say, here's the colleges, Alamo, Angelina, Austin, of course, Digitex, Grayson, Houston, Midland, San Jacinto, and Trinity Valley. So I had the opportunity to work with all of those colleges directly. 
So very excited. We were founded in 2007 around uh, creating awareness and expanding adoption of high quality OER to increase student success. And we do that through a, a number of things. We work with faculty, we have uh, free webinars, we also have uh, member only um, events, and we're also working on OER leadership uh, around the country and how we can bring that forward um, beyond state boundaries. So enough about that, because I want to get to the meat of this uh, this meeting today. Um, so we're just going to go through a few definitions here, and then we're about um, equity, anti-racism, and how OER and open pedagogy can um, can enable us to make those changes in our classroom and institutionally speaking. Um, and so we're going to focus on a couple of specific areas. One is the syllabus. Uh, one is um, the use of um, engaging um, images, inclusive images, um, and other resources to help students be able to see themselves in the classroom. And then a, a bit of a dive into open pedagogy and what that means, so the practices around open education. And then, um, as David mentioned, um, in a few minutes, 15 minutes or so, we will jump into some breakout rooms. You'll get to choose which of these topics you'd like to explore a little bit. Um, and then we'll come back to the main room and share out. All right, I'm gonna turn it over to Ursula. Great, thank you, Una. So let's start with the why. Why uh, is an open and equitable classroom important? So this is from Hard Truths, why only race conscious policies can fix racism in higher education. And I'll put the link in after I read this quote, but. It says, higher education has had a long history of excluding and underserving students who are not white, male, or affluent. It isn't enough to just believe that racial inequality is a problem. What policymakers, advocates, and citizens do about it matters most. Thank you, Ursula. And Tanja, would you like to speak to this? Tanja, your mic is off. Thank you, Una. Our next slide comes from the University of Southern California Center for Urban Education, and it discusses equity mindedness. The term equity mindedness refers to the perspective or mode of thinking exhibited by practitioners who, excuse me, <clears throat> who call attention to the pattern of it. Inequality in students' outcomes. These practitioners are willing to take personal and institutional responsibility for success of their students and critically reassessing their own practices. Each and every last one of us that are currently practicing open educational resources is open, is, it's called equity, they are equity mindedness. And the reason that I state that is because we have been utilizing open educational resources for a very long time. This is not a buzzword for us. Uh, I like to say that we were equitable when equitable wasn't cool. So we most definitely will continue to go forward in order to make our mission better than what it is today. So thank you for all of your contributions. Una. Alrighty. And so what can open education make possible? This is a this is a quote from the William and Laura Hewlett Foundation, which has supported open education for almost two decades now. And many of you may have worked on grants. They were behind the Achieving the Dream, Achieving the Dreams um, OER degree grant, that big program that ran a few years ago. And th th their focus here is they say it goes beyond just the resources and the textbooks that we use with our students. Of course, that's important, the, the low cost, removing the barriers for students. But access alone is not a guarantor of racial equity for learners. Learners should be supported and encouraged as sense makers and creators of their identities and their communities. So we need to bring that into the classroom, bring um, you know, student, students' lives into the classroom and let them see themselves there. And that's what uh, we're gonna talk some more about. Um, so I'm gonna turn this over to Tanja to talk a little bit about what she wants to do with the syllabus. Thank you, Una, again. I've created this acronym entitled PERT. And the reason that I use this acronym PERT because one of the definition of PERT means vital. As a faculty member, our syllabus is very important to us. It's like a contract, it's our guide. 
But as an open syllabus, the difference between that guide and that contract is that we're going to be inviting our students in order to help establish that syllabus and make it more of a fair playground or fair ground, I should say. So the P in PERT stands for policies and procedures. We know that every institution, there's required information that must be incorporated in every syllabus. But I also ask that you allow your class to create some type of policy and procedure to make them feel that they are part of the of the team to make them feel that they are a part of the class. So maybe the policy and procedure can be pertaining to the cell phone usage because you do use technology in your classroom. Maybe it could be um, uh, addressing the dress code uh, in your classroom uh, or, or, or recognizing different uh, apparels in your classroom as well. The E is gonna be for encouragement. In order for us to have a fair, grading process, they need a rubric and to utilize as their guide. So include some form of rubric in reference to your assessments, uh, in reference to any of your assignments. Also in your syllabus to keep uh, everything fair and, and to provide students with access, let them know about your auxiliary services, such as your library, your student resources. I most definitely utilize my library to the extreme. The first week of class, what I do is a library orientation. And I ask our librarian to always include open access and to teach my students to research utilizing open educational resources. Because again, when they complete an assignment, they can continue to progress and take this assignment with them to their four-year university when they transfer over. The R stands for responsibility. Responsibility of who? Well, you're responsible for your students and your students are responsible, uh, responsible for completing their assignments. So basically you need to let them know what your responsibility is to the classroom. And I also like to talk about the responsibility that they may have, I said personal, but social responsibility. If you are a member of a PWI, which is a predominantly white university, maybe you don't have as many um, minorities in your circle or within your institution. So you can still teach about diversity and equity. And this is through assignments. And we will talk about that when we um, break out for our syllabus. And the last one is the tone. Make sure you have a positive and encouraging tone. And Ursula will be addressing the use of visualization using um, different images in your classroom. So Ursula, I guess the next slide belongs to you. Great, thank you, Tanja. So um, when we talk about diverse images, it's important to remember that we're talking about more than simply race or ethnicity. And of course, many of us um, have intersecting identities. So the, these are just some of the different considerations when you're looking for diverse images. Next slide, please. So why is it important to diversify the images in educational course? In her essay, Changing Our Discourse, a Distinctive Social Justice Aligned Definition of Open Education, Sarah Lambert points out that there are different types of justice that OER can serve. Um, representational justice, which involves equi equitable representation and political voice are critical. It's important to remember that it's a matter of justice. Also, knowledge of humanity. Imagine if you're a dermatologist, but the only pictures of skin diseases in your textbook are of those diseases on white skin. Well, that's exactly what happened. A 2020 article in the Journal of American Academy of Dermatology cited that a study of general medicine textbooks showed minimal skin type diversity with only 4.5% of images showing dark skin. In dermatology, visual diagnosis and pattern recognition are affected by the background skin type. Engagement. Students are more engaged when their textbooks reflect them. And, and Una will talk a little bit more about this later. Just accurately reflecting our wor world, regardless of the demographics of your institution, it's, an imp it's important to accurately reflect the beautiful, diverse world we live in. 
and also alt text and uh, attribution, which we'll talk um, about a little bit more. Um, next slide, please. So here's some amazing art um, pictures that that I was able to find while looking for diverse images. And all of these are openly licensed. And I'll tell you where I got them in a minute. Next slide. So attribution is key in uh, OER. The ideal attribution has the title, the creator with a link, the source with a link, and the license. So you know how open it is. Um, next slide, please. Finally, where can you find these images? And, and we'll dive more into this in the breakout room. Um, you can start here on the CCC OER Equity and Openness blog. There's a great piece by Heather Blitcher, from, who's an assistant professor at Southern New Hampshire University. And uh, there's also a great resource at Open Oregon, at that website, openoregon.org backslash open images. Um, Amy Hoffer has collected a, a really inclusive list. And I love this list because it doesn't say, here's the, here's the diverse images and here's all the other images. It's just a list of resources for finding images. And some of them specifically are about um, focused on diversity, like the disabled and here list. Others are just images. Um, and then of course you can always look in Google image search, but you need to just pay careful attention to, to what you're looking at. So um, thank you. Great, thank you, Tanja and Ursula. And uh, yes, Audrey uh, asked, will the slides be made available? Yes, um, the slides will be made available. I'll share a link at the end of this um, to the Google slides. Um, Sorry, I don't have them handy, the link right now. But um, yes, so thank you, Tanja and Ursula. I mean, and what Tanja and Ursula were really describing there is, is open educational resources, certainly in the case of the diverse images um, and other media. Uh, and Tanja was talking about open practices, so which is another word for open pedagogy. And so just, to, just kind of a little sort of summary of how this works is, you know, most people come to this, uh, certainly faculty and staff, um, come to it from the cost of the textbooks. You know, uh, students aren't able to afford them, so they're coming to class, they're not prepared. Uh, we know from quite a bit of research that students aren't happy about that, and they say they don't do as well in their classes because they don't have access to their textbooks. So that's how we first get on the bandwagon with open educational resources. But that then opens up this whole world of access to knowledge and the fact that we can be creators of knowledge um, and we can invite our students in for them to bring their own lived experiences into our classroom. And that is really the blossoming of open pedagogy. It's beyond that cost, which is important still, but it's really about broadening this to um, include open practices that include students. Now there's a really great quote over here. I won't read it to you on the right-hand side. It's from a student at uh, Keene State College in um, New, New Hampshire. And she talks about accountability. So when students are, are involved in the curation and sometimes even the creation of resources for the classroom, they're accountable, they're responsible. They have choices around the work that they do. And so it's, it's a two-way street. It really brings students in as, um, as active learners. And um, so, but, but I, I do want to just touch on this at one point is that the, the five permissions of OER are very important. They allow this uh, recreate, this creation of materials, this revising, remixing, reusing, redistributing, retaining. So this is kind of the technology behind it, but it's very important uh, that those capabilities that open licensing gives us. Um, Sometimes we use a code word kind of renewable assignments. So if, for those of you who might be new to open pedagogy, you might not have heard that expression, but that speaks around, it speaks to creating um, assignments for students that are um, 
can be used outside the classroom. So I can kind of give you an example of one that isn't. So, you know, many English faculty assign a um, English essay um, on the same topic, you know, semester after semester, they're the only one that reads what the student turns in. And it basically is, it's not used again. And, and it and it and it maybe isn't that interesting to the student, uh, and and I'll tell you, faculty tell me that they don't want to read those anymore. They've been reading those for years. So it's about giving students some choice, uh, being very learner centered, uh, connected to the community. Perhaps there's a discipline that the student is majoring in. Maybe the essay focuses on that. Um, and using those five hours of open, you can invite your students to share their work publicly. Perhaps. Um, they could share it with experts in that discipline if the student chooses and you as a faculty would work with them on that. So there's a there's so many different ways to do it. And I'm going to give you an example of one case. So I, I happen to be I have the uh, the good fortune of working on a program called Open for Anti-Racism. And we're working with um, 17 faculty in California community colleges. And one, this is one specific example. There's a California history professor who's working with his students um, on bringing their family history into the classroom and having them bring their family stories in the form of oral histories, his, any historical documents, letters, photos that uh, that student might have, and teaching them about archiving that information as, as though it were, you know, the more traditional uh, historical archives. And they happen to be in San Joaquin Valley. So they're also curating historical documents around the region that they live in. So it's connected to learning, connected to the community and connected to the student, most importantly. And they will have the choice then of sharing that publicly outside of the classroom if they so choose. That we always want to let students have that choice uh, because some students may choose not to do that, but um, it's a wonderful resume builder for students who are who are comfortable with sharing publicly. Um, and I think we're just about ready to go into breakout rooms. Um, Tanja, did you want to give a real quick overview of yours, um, your breakout room? I did. Um, thank you, Una. In our breakout room, we will utilize a syllabus, but I would like for the audience to basically be able to come up with a syllabus, scenarios, and reference if you were attending a predominantly white university, uh, how would you bring multiculturalism to your students? The second scenario that we're gonna address, if you were a faculty member of a Hispanic serving institution, how will you allow your syllabus to reflect your student body? So that is two of the uh, objectors that we will hope to discuss in our syllabus breakout room. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Tanja. All right, Ursula. Yeah, we're going to talk about um, your textbook and what kind of images are you looking for? And then, um, and after these breakout rooms, we will come back and we'll have some more information to share. Great, thank you. And so um, I'm gonna share some more uh, great examples of non-disposable assignments, but I really wanna hear um, from the folks who join me about what they wanna do in their classroom or what they're already doing. Um, and this is really about getting inspired about the possibilities. So thank you. And um, I think we're ready for the breakout rooms, Jocelyn or... Um... Hello everyone. If you look in the bottom of your screen, you'll see the options to join any of the three breakout rooms the ladies have mentioned. So feel free to click on those options.
Hello, is there anyone that needs assistance to go to your breakout room? Miss Rachel, which breakout room would you like? Perfect. Everybody, that was way too short. Yeah, we just barely got started. I and I, I there was some really great stuff in my in my room, and I'm sure everyone else's. Um, oh, that was not what I intended to do. <laughs> but um, let's get started um, with the folks who are. And excuse me for this. Let's get started with the folks who are in the syllabus room. Could would you like to share? Um, Tanja, did you have somebody who wanted to share? I don't, did I, uh, David, did you, would you like to share? Was there someone else that liked to share? <clears throat> I think what we, uh, what was sort of coming forward was this uh, idea of being collaborative with, this, with the students and getting them to feel some kind of agency uh, to the curriculum and commitment. Um, and the other thing that was sort of pointed out was the importance of, um, making sure that the syllabus ultimately maps onto, um, uh, or the Blackboard site ultimately maps onto the syllabus. And, and that's something I know uh, probably every, uh, every university and college, community college struggles with um, is ensuring that the access on the Blackboard site or whatever uh, the student learning platform you're using is is easy to sort of identify the structure of and, and so I like that idea of um, that, that that Dr. Connor, Connor Lee, uh, pointed out to us so anybody else thank you David would anybody else like to uh, comment about the open syllabus And again, I will put the, the syllabus that we utilize. Uh, it will be a part of our workshop uh, information. And again, I think the most important thing that I wanted uh, the audience to take away about the syllabus is, is um, when you are revising your syllabus, make sure you advise it, revise it pertaining to your audience. So if I teach psych, and my friend teaches sociology, our syllabus would not be exactly the same, even though we may have the core concepts and the core SLOs, because her audience may be much different than my audience. She may have someone from the LBGTQ community in her class. I may have more Hispanics in my class. So I want to make sure that my syllabus is going to be open um, to, to, the, to all the students in, in, in the classroom. Thank you, Una. Okay, great. Thank you, Tanja. Um, and um, now I want to turn it over to Ursula's team um, to hear more about that. Does anyone oh. in the that was in our um, images, diverse images break group want to want to speak? Well, we had a quick <laughs> discussion, um, and we and we looked at um, where you can find some of those links, and and then all the information that you need to use that link, the 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 source, the title of the the picture of the image, and then the license, um, what you need to know so that you can use it. Great. And I put a link in the, this chat um, for another resource for images. Yeah, thank you for that, Ursula. All right, well, um, oh, I'm sorry. I keep thinking I need to click to the next slide, but this is the slide we need to stay on. So my group was uh, had some wonderful things that they do in their classroom, and I'm just gonna invite them to share some of the things that they do that are what we would call open pedagogy or open practices. Um, please, uh, anyone who was in there, um, and even if you didn't get a chance to share, because we really underestimated, we could have spent a half hour in there um, easily. And we only had half that time. Um, Carla, I'm going to call on somebody if nobody speaks. Carla um, actually was 
in the process of telling us about a great idea she had um, right as we ended, do, would you like to mention uh, the idea uh, that you shared with us, Carla? Well, while Carla's figuring out her mic or she, maybe she had to leave, she wanted to uh, create kind of a 3D space um, where students could kind of enter a gallery um, and, um, and, I'm, and see other um, examples um, of things. And it triggered something in me because I'm working with these faculty in California. Uh, they're doing, um, it's, and it's a um, chemistry faculty and she's inviting her students to do um, short biographies of non-traditional scientists uh, that students get to choose who, um, and to and you know, and she's encouraging them to choose them from their their cultural ethnic background, um, and so to show all those scientists that are out there that we don't hear about, um, traditionally speaking. And so I, it sounds a little bit like what Carla was suggesting around creating a gallery of these. Um, that uh, students could engage with. They could not only create their own uh, scientists that they're putting together um, and, then in, and then encourage everyone to come in and, and see this as a gallery of these amazing non-scientists that are come from non-traditional backgrounds and cultural experiences. So- um, Hi, yes, else? thank you. Thank you, Nat. I just wanna say a couple of words on that. Um, I normally have students, I'm a history instructor, so I normally have students work with um, artifacts that they can choose from a list that I give them, as well as some secondary um, materials. And then they present, if it were in class, they would work in small groups and present together. Um, however, what with especially with uh, online focus now, I'm interested in shifting that to an online format like you were describing, where it would help students feel like they're leaving their rooms, they're leaving the computer board and, and going into another world or another space, right? Where I could post some of the materials that I want them to review, but where they can also then share what they're doing. Because part of my goal is to have them shift from being just simply consumers of history to producers and critical thinkers of that entire process of how history is created. So if anyone's familiar with any resources, that are like that, I'd appreciate it. Um, Cause I know some students have found some online but many of them, they charge you. In the past, some students have found some. So I'm interested in learning more about how to either create that myself or find available examples. Thank you. Yeah, and I thank you, Carla. You just described open pedagogy for us perfectly. Um, <laughs> I, I don't know a technical technology platform for that, but um, I will look into it. And I and I, there may be folks here who who know about that. So if anyone if anyone has something they can help Carla with, uh, please speak up now, or you can put it in the chat window, or uh, perhaps connect with her later. Well, while people are gathering their thoughts, I want to say thank you so much. Um, as I mentioned, you know, I um, I direct the Community College Consortium for OER, and we're a whole community um, who works on um, lots of different activities. Uh, most of them are online. Um, of course, during the days when we can meet at conferences, we do we do join um, folks for those. But we have a set of spring webinars uh, coming up. Um, uh, we have one in April on K through 12 collaborations with Community College, which um, we'd love to have you join. They're they're free and open to all open to all educators, um, and actually they're not exclusive to educators. Our community email list is a place where you can ask questions, like Carla's question. I want to create this gallery idea, and Carla would put that in her own words. Those are my words. But this community email is all about OER. Um, it is primarily community college, but certainly not exclusively. We have um, four-year college and university folks as well, and we appreciate uh, their insights and their questions as well. And we have different guest blogs that are published throughout the years. We've been focusing on EDI for the last three years, so we have an ongoing one. We also do student OER impact stories. So if you have a student who's um, really involved in OER or really has something 
has something they want to say about it, uh, contact us. We'd, we'd love to have their story. Um, and here's, here's a links to a bunch of other um, resources, some of them that we touched on today. Um, and I highly recommend if you're interested in diving deeper, this is a place to go. And I think we're just open for any questions at this point. And um, in the meanwhile, I'm gonna um, stop sharing my screen for a minute so that I can get that link to the um, slides for folks. But um, Ursula, Tanja and I are here to answer questions. So please, um, uh, we, we welcome that. You know, I have a quick question, and this is a basic question for Ursula. Um, she said there there were some specific um, pieces to any kind of bibliographic reference we, we need to make. And um, I imagine it gets kind of long with all these URLs. Is there a, a sort of a preferred method for, for pointing readers to a specific site, or, or is that even necessary? Well, you can uh, make it a a hyperlink. So you put the title of the picture um, and then in the title of the, the that image or picture, uh, you can make that the hyperlink to the source. So if the source is a long URL, then it's, it's there, but it's hidden in the hyperlink. But, um, and then just putting um, the, License, which is usually really small, CC by 2.0 or 4.0, and that should fit in there. But yes, um, some of those pictures that I posted, uh, the name of the picture is really long, and so it, it can be large. But sometimes people use notes, uh, like footnotes. They'll they'll use that for the the picture. But yes, title, creator, source, and link um, are the four points that you need to include in attribution. We sometimes call that the tassel, with changing creator to author. <laughs> it's a little acronym, title, author, source, and license. There is a resource on Open Washington called the Attribute Builder, uh, which is open to anyone. Um, for images, I you probably don't need to use it for the images you it, because you can, it's quite easy often to do the images. Um, if you're doing a lot of remixing of content, um, the attributions become quite important. And, the, and in that case, I would recommend the Open Washington Attribution um, Builder. And it's, uh, it's at Open Washington. I haven't used it in a while. I, I'll see if I can find that link for you, David. Other questions? Thank you, Carla, for sharing that. Um, and some Oh, okay. 2D rather than. There is a question. In, yeah, questions in the. Um... Yeah, from Amy. Yes. <clears throat> so let's see what. Uh, okay, there is the attribution builder. So Amy asked Does anyone know of organizations working on open courseware that aims to overcome costs associated with things like. <laughs> That's a big question, Amy. Um... <laughs> So, um, are you talking about the access codes and so forth? Um, so there's, there's, um, right. Yeah. That these, and this is Amy. Um, I, I posed the question. So these tools are, are very good and, and helpful to a lot of students, but they, they still have a cost associated with them and we're having a hard time getting faculty to move away from these kinds of things and try to do other things and that that replace them, but so I'm wondering if there are things out there that can replace them that people are doing that to. So Amy, where are you located? Just out of curiosity. Oh, I'm at Texas Wesleyan University in Fort Worth. Okay, so I know you have statewide grants um, that encourage faculty and other technology developers. Frankly, it's usually a when you're replacing these, um, it does involve um, some technology along with the faculty who's the subject matter expert. Um, there has been a, a, a more and more of a focus on these, what we call ancillaries, 
um, in recent years. Um, OpenStax has done a, actually a fairly good job in offering very low cost ancillaries around things like online homework systems uh, for their uh, textbooks. Um, I know in California where I'm located and we also have a lot of members there, um, is uh, they they have their statewide academic senate has a grant program where they're focusing on these ancillaries um, because I, I hear what you're saying amy they're really key um, for student success we don't want to take away things um, that um, without having replacements to help students i mean the point of this is student success on the other hand if students can't afford them um, you know they're they're trying to get by without them but um, so Thank you. Thank you for that question. It's you'd have to kind of go through these individually. There, there are some good alternatives for, for my math lab. Um, and I'm not a math faculty, so I'm, <laughs> I'm not going to take that one on. But there are some some great alternatives out there for that one. I don't I'm not I'm less familiar with the other ones. Um, thank you. But, yeah. So thank you for asking that one. It's a, it's a good point. Um, I know we need to wrap up, um, and so I want to give um, Tanja and Ursula an opportunity to um, share any last minute recaps with folks. Well, from the open syllabus part, I just want to, as a faculty member, I really want to encourage you to allow your students to partner with you to create an open uh, classroom. Uh, because again, once they start utilizing this, these materials, uh, if they are at a two-year college, they can utilize these materials and take it to the four-year college with them as well. Uh, so again, that's a, that's a major plus when you're researching and utilizing uh, open educational resources in, in your classroom. Thank you again for attending, and I hope to see you guys face-to-face -face at our next conference instead of videoing. Yeah, and I just want to say thank you for um, letting me letting us speak about this. If you have any additional questions, please um, email me. Also, if you find a great resource for diverse images, please send it to me. I, I really want to see what else is out there. Thanks. All right. And I'm just going to say, if you want to engage more with um, other folks in the OER community, do check out our community email list. It's a Google group. You can add yourself in. You can remove yourself at any time. Uh, you can ask any question related to OER, and chances are you'll have half a dozen answers by the end of the day. So um, love, to, love to see you online um, in, the, in the near future. Um, thank you so much for coming. And thank you, David, for supporting us, and Jocelyn for supporting us as well. Hey, thank, thank you, Una, Tanja, and Ursula. Um, everybody uh, will see you at the next session.